So hello everyone. Actually, I'm really excited because um, this is, I think, uh, the first uh, Google event that I'm speaking after one and a half year, I guess. And uh, since I moved to Poland, Krakow, so yeah, it's uh, pretty special for me as well. And thank you all for inviting me and uh, letting me speak here. So uh, let me share a brief uh, overview, but before I do that, let me maybe, it's a good idea to introduce myself first. So I'm a senior data scientist uh, currently working at Brainly. Brainly is a tech uh, company. Uh, we are leading it in this space and uh, we have uh, branches. I, I guess we have our product on around 35 countries all over the world. And yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, um, it's dedicated to students uh, and using Brainly, you can get answers uh, to the questions that you have while studying and following your course material. So feel free to check out. And yeah, I'm also a Google developer expert on machine learning. I've been at ZDE since uh, 2018, I guess. So it's been a while. Uh, but I recently moved to Europe, Poland, and it's been like, like I said, one and a half year. So yeah. Uh, pretty exciting and yeah, so let's begin. So uh, this is a short outline of what I'm going to share today. So firstly, I'll be talking about my project, which I'm going to talk in a bit more detail soon. And uh, this project is basically divided into two parts. Uh, one is machine learning part, deep learning to be specific. Second is the Flutter application that I built myself to host this machine learning model that I built. And I've also published a resource paper around it. And uh, lastly, there are some resources that you can follow to build similar application on your, on your own. So yeah, let me begin by overview. So uh, it's uh, pretty interesting because uh, I just realized that this is a Google Developer Cloud event. And uh, the talk I'm mostly talking about is uh, outside of the cloud. So it's mostly on device. And it's uh, it's a bit of uh, funny irony there, but you can leverage cloud to train the model, not to deployment, but to the training part, of course. And yeah, so about this project, this project is called Pest Recognizer. Uh, to be specific, it's an advanced uh, multi-class uh, classification model uh, to uh, you know recognize a type of a pest insect in a in a photograph of a plant. So yeah, so using this uh, project, uh, anyone who wants to like recognize what kind of insect is, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, on top of their plant or something with a photograph, they can do it on device offline in real time. So it's, uh, it's pretty nice and helpful to know, like, uh, if, uh, uh, if you want to, you know, like know what kind of pest is, uh, destroying your plant or crop or whatever, you know? So, yeah. So the, the motivation behind this project is mostly about building something that can be beneficial to the society and the community. So it's uh, around the idea of social good, social AI, AI for social good. And mostly it's also, also for educational purposes. So uh, to be brutally honest here, I wanted to explore and develop something by the way, this project is like uh, one and a half or two years old. So during that time, I also wanted to explore further how, what else I can develop around Flutter and deep learning that can you know, help people who don't have internet connection and at the same time benefit, uh, uh, benefit from this um, uh, technology we have. I just saw one question here. Classi yeah, this is a image classification problem. And I am not using Vision API. I'm using my own model to perform this classification. But I'll uh, talk about that uh, in, a, in a while. So yeah, this is supervised multi-class uh, classification model. As you can see, this is uh, pretty much the outline of the project. So I'll talk about that in a while as well. And I use Flutter for both iOS and Android. So yeah. So as you can see, this is a two part uh, project. One is deep learning, another is the mobile application part. So there are, uh, so there are some, uh, you know, like sub uh, steps in each, each of these parts. So I'll also talk about that. 
in a while. So let's begin by machine learning. So let's talk about the part revolving around building this deep learning model. So firstly, I have used this uh, IP102 data set. This is a publicly available data set free to use for academic and research purposes. It has around 75,000 images and it has like 102 different classes of this best insect. And uh, the, the way these uh, classes are named are in a more like a hierarchical uh, structure. Like uh, if there is a crop like a wheat or paddy, and uh, as you can see in the image, I'm not sure how well you can see because it kind of uh, small, but basically like the labels are like reef, uh, rice leaf roller or something, you know, like signifying that this particular pest or insect is for rice and it's on the leaf and so on. So that way one particular, particular class is named like that. In, in that order, it's like set 102 different classes. So this is a multi-class classification problem on image data set. And yeah, okay. And this data set was also accepted in CPV, CVPR 2019. So using this data set, uh, I have developed the deep learning model for my project. So yeah, that's the overview of the data set. So let me talk about pre-processing and data set creation part. So basically I use a two-step process here. One is pre-processing. So basically these images are in a varying width and height and they don't follow specific fixed sizes. So for a deep learning model, you need to first resize these images into a certain specific format. So uh, basically what I did is I resized those images uh, to something 150 by 150, three, three, three channel images and rescale them or normalize them between zero and one because uh, the pixel values for these images are between zero to 255. So you have to rescale them. And then I converted those images into TF data format. That way I can send those uh, images for the training procedure using TensorFlow Keras. And for the training split or data set split, uh, what I did is I created this um, five different uh, cross validation split uh, so that like you can, if you're fam already familiar with the scaffold uh, cross validation sp uh, split strategy, I did similar, but in a more custom manner. No, not the scikit-learn, I just saw another comment. Yeah, no, not the scikit-learn, but TensorFlow Keras. Yeah, and uh, so what I did here is that I created five different scenarios for the split. So in one of those scenarios, it's like 60% training data, 40% validation and test data set. Similarly for another, it's like 40% training, then larger, larger allocated to the validation and test. And some in one of the scenario, it was like 80% uh, training set, so on. The reason I did that because uh, even though we have like 75,000 different images, I wanted you by building your machine learning model or deep learning model by using this different uh, cross validation split for your data set, you kind of ensure that your model is not overfitted over specific split or the data set. So by training these multiple models on a different uh, data set split, you, you by you know, looking at the performance score of all these different models, you know which model is more overfitted and so on. So that way it can help you realize the overfitting of your deep learning model. So yeah, so for pre-processing, uh, pre uh, preparing the data set itself, it's a two-step process, pre-processing and training split. Uh, and in split, like I said, I have I have entertained like five different scenarios. And uh, after the split is done, uh, I jump to this uh, model creation part, model architecture. Here, basically, I used a mo mobile net model, but uh, here also I created like five different scenarios or five different, let's just say, cases around. Like uh, as you can see in the image here, uh, even though I'm using mobile net as a backbone, the number of uh, fully connected layers, number of uh, uh, units in those fully connected layers, amount of dropout and so on. Uh, I, I selected five different uh, variation for them as well. And uh, the reason for that is again, I wanted to explore for uh, you know not just one architecture at a time, but different one. 
And yeah, so like I also mentioned earlier, the, I resized the image from two to four, which was like a default uh, image size for the mobile net architecture to 150 and 150. And yeah, in, in general, in default uh, mobile net, they are trained on image net data sets. So they have uh, like 1000 classes as, a, as their output, but I need to change, change that to 102 classes. And uh, not only the architecture, but I also created five different scenarios for the group of hyperparameter ranges. So yeah, in this case, the hyperparameter groups that I selected are batch size optimizers and learning rate. So by mean batch size, I mean like while creating those splits and creating the data loaders around it, I change different batch, batch sizes, 16, 32, 128, and so on. For optimizers, I use uh, uh, SCD, uh, ADAM, ADAGRAD, and so on. So there are like five different values for that as well. And for learning rate, it was something around uh, minus zero, minus five to minus two, I think. So I will also say like which one was the best performing, performing and so on. So, and after that, uh, basically I use uh, transfer learning and fine tuning on top of that. So not just that I use the predictive power of pre-trained model of this mobile net, but I also retrain, fine tune the backbone itself to my new data set. So yeah, that was the architecture. Then uh, I perform the training. So like I said, there are, there are like five different cases for like, architecture choices, data set splits, and hyperparameter, group of hyperparameter values. So in total, it was like 125 different models to be trained. And as you can see, it's a bit of a, it's a big number of models. And uh, these are all the, you know, like uh, training laws, validation laws, uh, accuracy of those 125 different models that I trained. Yeah, it's pretty hard to read from that, but you get the idea, like these are all varying in performance, right? So yeah, after that, after the training procedure is done, what I did is that I picked the best performing model out of these 125 models and further retrained for 20 more epochs. So by the way, I forgot to mention, earlier here, I trained the whole 125 models for 10 epochs. Uh, fix uh, 10 epochs just to understand which one is more uh, performing than the other. Then after selecting the best performing one, I selected that one and retrained for another 20 epochs. And the final performance score that I got was training accuracy around 96%, test accuracy about 95%. And I also evaluated uh, my uh, selected model for uh, in another holdout data set. And there, as you can see, the performance on certain classes are like this. So these are like top performing classes for my model. So as you can see here, uh, right leaf roller is like some of the images, they are like 99% confident and so on. So they are like the top five performing classes out of 102 uh, classes. Uh, by the way, I'll also share the research paper later on where you can see everything in more detail. So yeah, so this is the performance part. This is the training of the deep learning model. Okay, uh, I just saw one question, overfitted model. Uh, what do you mean by that, Daniel? I think it's because on the second graph, uh, yeah, the, the, the blue line uh, mm -hmm. is uh, with more epochs reducing the loss but the validation, which is the orange line, is not improving, so it could be... Yes, yes, yeah. yes, it is, yes, yes. And yeah, it's slightly overfitted, uh, sure, yeah, as you can see from the graph, but in overall, it's uh, it's performing well. You cannot totally avoid the overfitting, sadly, it's, uh, it's very tricky for that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, some of the performance in some of the classes are like 99% confident, but, uh, you know, like uh, I have not really tested in a more real life scenario, like with the different lights and so on. So my assumption here would be like, if you take this model out in the real world and test it, uh, at least like the model should give you like 70, 80% confident in, in each of the classes. So uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, but you know, like even for the, even, you know, the training data set, 
it's usual to get uh, above 90 percent or above 95 percent it's a usual procedure but in real life uh, when there are noises involved and a data set that are beyond your distribution it's uh, tricky so even the best performing models sometimes fail so for this data set that i'm trained on the, this data set that i use for a holdout it was like this but it still need to be tested exhaustively i guess yeah you know so yeah but it's pretty nice uh, these are all from the test data set so yeah uh, I have not included the ROC curve, but I believe the uh, F1 score, precision recall are around 90 to 93% uh, as well. Uh, I can send you the link later on and you can look at it. Okay, so after the model is trained, uh, the, I need to, so basically, TensorFlow Keras, uh, they train the model, they save the model in this protobuffer, save model format. So I needed to use this model offline in mobile application. So it was not possible to use as it is. So what I did is I used TF Lite and converted that uh, trained model into a, a TF Lite model, which is like a flat buffer file and applied quantization techniques. So basically quant with quantization, what it does is that it uh, converts your floating point uh, weight, uh, weights to integer. And that way, you know, like uh, while running on your mobile devices, it's, uh, it's a bit faster and less com computative, you know, like less uh, exhaustive in computation. So yeah, so basically uh, to recap and to cover the deep learning part, uh, I entertain like 125 different models here, uh, select the best one, uh, retrain for another 20 epochs, uh, and then on that model, I convert it to TF Lite model, and this model will be used for the mobile application. Now, uh, let's head over to the Flutter part. So uh, this is the... Um, architecture behind the Flutter application. This is basically a diagram, high-level diagram here. So uh, to just uh, give you the idea about how it works. So not only, you know, like using your deep learning model for prediction, I wanted to, like this is out of personal curiosity. And what I wanted to do is not just prediction, but uh, add furthermore, uh, you know, like functionality in this application. So basically uh, what I did is that I created one feature to, you know, like do the prediction on the images from your camera or, or the images that you have saved in, saved in your mobile device. And after making that prediction, I wanted to save that prediction so that you can revisit later on. So for that, what I did is I used this SQL light and uh, I also added a, phase or like a section here that can show you what are those 102 different classes available for the prediction. And here, I'm sorry, but uh, these are like different buttons for the different features. So basically the top one is uh, detect. This will basically let you do this uh, prediction phase. Second one is the past record, past prediction made on with the date and everything and the number of classes here. And uh, the last one is the change language. So uh, I wanted to build a application that is not only in English, but in a more regional language as well. So I'm from Nepal. So most of us, we speak in Nepali language and I created a feature to change the language to Nepali as well. And on top of that, I know a lot of farmers are in the Southern part of Nepal where they also speak Hindi. So. Uh, I have also added another language, uh, Hindi language there. So it, you can change the application language in, from, uh, from English, Hindi, and Nepali, and so on. So these are like three different languages you can select on. So yeah, this is the overview of the um, application. And the reason I chose Flutter is basically, you know, like um, to be brutally honest here as well, uh, learning um, Kotlin or Swift or Object C for only this particular project was a bit overwhelming. And Flutter seems to be very easy to grasp, you know, and I could really create all these uh, features like in a week or so. So it wasn't that, um, you know, like uh, uh, the learning curve was not that high. So as you can see, it's uh, for a 
you know, data scientist or machine learning developer, it's pretty handy to develop such application if you use Flutter. And performance was on point in terms of applications. So yeah, that was a great experience. Uh, yeah, so here are some of the packages that I use. So out of the box, uh, Flutter doesn't, uh, you know, like come with PF Lite support and so on. So you need to, like in Python, you need to import packages here. So TF Lite package is there to, you know, use a TF Lite model. There is SQL Lite uh, package. And there are like different uh, utility packages like image speaker to sell it whether you want to use a camera or the gallery on your phone, share preference that saves your past record in key value pair, and language support, of course, for the translation, uh, parsing the Unicode and so on. So, yeah, I see another comment here. When preparing the data images, have used to resize the image. Ah, okay. Hmm. So, I think I use, uh, so basically for the mobile, uh, basically for the deep learning part, I use Python and everything was done on a Jupyter notebook. So I might have used PIL for resize and later on use TF data from memory tensors, memory or something. But I have to look up the notebook again to verify that. But you, uh, I have shared everything. Uh, at, at the end of this presentation, you can also go there and check it yourself. Okay, so yeah, moving on. So let me just share with you the demo. So, uh, so basically, this is the whole application. And since uh, our talk is more about machine learning and deep learning, I I did not include much of this slide here about the Flutter and the Dart, but I have shared the code and everything. So you can look at uh, yourself uh, through my GitHub repo. So feel free to do that. Let me just share with you the demo. Uh, I have recorded my mobile phone while, you know, like giving you this, uh, to share with you how it works. So let's just hope it works. Okay. So this is the UI. And as you can see, first you can change the language. Uh, yeah. And yeah, this is how it seems. This is the classes section. You have like 102 different classes that the model can make predictions on. And when you go back, uh, there are like past record section where I have used, when I use the prediction and what kind of classes were detected. And then you can uh, detect uh, image, either you use camera or like this uh, test uh, image from the mobile phone or the images that you have taken from elsewhere and so on. So basically you select the image you want to predict on and yeah. Uh, the prediction is real time. The text you see underneath the preview image is basically the prediction made by the model here. Uh, I have shared the trend model, the application, and so on. E everything is open source on my GitHub repo. You can go and check it. Yeah, and I have also published a research paper around it. So if you want to know in more detail, you can go to this link and check this paper. I have outlined everything about the test cases and everything there. Yeah, and yeah, so if you want to know, you know, like learn more about uh, these things that I've just shared with you, uh, Keras IO examples is the number one resource, of course. There is also another repo called Awesome TF Lite. So if you are interested in TF Lite and stuff, so not only image classification, but text classification, object detection, and so on different uh, examples are there. Uh, here is a link to my repo as well. And if you want to learn uh, Flutter, there is a link and they are all excellent to follow uh, for any beginner. So in short, this is my presentation. Uh, so yeah, feel free to ask if you have any question. Uh, one more thing that I failed to include here. So like I mentioned in earlier part of this presentation, this project is, is a bit old. So if you want to develop similar project, I would suggest, of course, go for the Vertex AI because using your personal computer is a bit limiting when it comes to images and images like thousands of examples of images. So it's always good to have this cloud resource at your disposal to train. And you can use uh, this um, uh, hyperparameter tuning library called Keras Tuner, which I really like because if I, if I were to do, you know, like, a, uh, fine tune the model and I use hyperparameter optimization now using TensorFlow and Keras, I would use Keras tuner. 
it's very uh, very efficient. You just provide the range of values you want to search through, and it will do a lot of optimizations for you, like Bayesian optimization for hyperparameter optimization, random search, and so on. So you can even select the strategy there. So it's more efficient, and yeah, you can explore that now. And even in TensorFlow Lite, there are like uh, currently there are like uh, the features are amazing. Like uh, when I converted those uh, models uh, for this project, it was a bit limiting. I, I guess now you can uh, do in-training quantization, not post-training. So you can quantize, quantize your um, model as you train them. So you don't have to first train the model and perform the quantization later on. So there are like, Lots of new features added on TF Lite now, so it's a good time to you know like look through those resources and learn. Thank you, thank you for your great presentation. I don't Thanks. know about the participants, but I think it was really interesting. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Thank you everyone for listening to me for around half an hour. So I hope it was inform informative for you all.